So I titled this message, Paul's Concluding Thoughts, because the last of this letter is written um, in such an interesting way. Um, Paul often had a scribe that would write with him. Um, and at the end of this letter, he just, he just starts writing himself uh, in this letter. But th- to recap the letter, if you haven't been here for uh, all the studies, Galatians is a, is a short letter written to churches, plural, in the what we would call central Turkey today, Galatia. Uh, and it really deals with going back to the law, going back to Judaism and, and having Jesus but then deciding that Jesus isn't an actual, he's not enough. And so you go back to the law and you go, well, we need both. We need the old covenant and the new covenant because the new one's not enough. That's what these Judaizers were trying to tell these folks in the church. And some of them were buying in and some of them were being manipulated. And some of them were scared because the Judaizers were brilliant and they knew so much. And some of these folks are novices. And some of them were just like, hey, I don't, I, I've never even heard of God. Like when Paul came, that was the first time I ever heard the name. Um, I just was worshiping sticks and doing whatever, you know, like like in the uh, Veggie Tales with uh, St. Patrick. Um, the people just worshiping the earth and sticks and trees and whatnot. And I heard that Jesus loved me. And, and then these guys came in and they're brilliant and they have all these cool clothes. And so they're telling us, oh, yeah, you need to keep, you need to be circumcised. You need to go back to the law. You need to keep the festivals. You need to keep the law. That's what Paul was trying to combat. Paul was the most Jewish person that there was to say these types of things, that Paul knew the law, Paul knew everything in it, Paul probably had the Old Testament memorized. And he's saying, look, if anybody should be doing that, it's me. I'm preaching Christ and him crucified alone, and I'm the enemy. I'm being persecuted. So understand these people are manipulating you, and they want you to love them. They want you to worship them. They want you to be uh, underneath them. And I'm just trying to tell you, hey, that's not freedom. That's bondage. So that's, that's the recap in a nutshell. And in verse 6, uh, 6 through 8, um, he says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap the flesh, excuse me, will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. So much in here. Um, But verse six is talking about paying these guys that are teaching in these churches. Um, That that, uh, the old school mentality in the Old Testament was Jewish people are taxed basically. There's a tithe, but there's also a temple tax. There's, There's so many things that they knew they were supposed to do. Now, once again, not everybody's Jewish in these letters that Paul's writing. Um, Paul's writing a lot to a lot of what you and I would call Europe today. But there's a lot of stories about money in the church. There's a lot of people who have been burned by money in the church. There's a lot of people who say, hey, uh, you know, I was, I was watching TV and I saw this guy on TV and he said, send me your money. I'm going to have to shut my church. And the next thing I know, Kenneth Copeland's flying on a citation C-70 jet. And so maybe he wasn't as poor as he said. I don't know. Well, I looked up Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland's salary and it's really high. He's still around. He's apparently, I could be wrong. Um, but five mil is what, what it looked like. And obviously, there's five or six others that are above that if you look up pastor salary, excuse me for the P. Um, I'm not talking about like somebody who just starts a ministry somewhere or a Catholic uh, priest or whatever. I'm talking about evangelical pastors or those that get lumped into it. And there's a lot of guys that make a lot of money. But what he's saying is this is a completely radical thought to, to pay a pastor. Because once again, they were under the tithe law. We are not under a tithe law. People use that word tithe all the time just because it's easy. They've been taught something like that. But this is their trade. This is their job. They work at the church. They work in the church. They don't have time to work in the church and outside of the church, so pay them. And there's a balance for what this pay should be, somewhere between poverty and five mil. You're supposed to laugh there. Um, I'm kidding. But I want to read, the, I want to read a, a, a cool kind of thought on these verses um, from uh, one of my favorites, um, Donald Campbell. 
He says, one responsibility of each believer is to shoulder the financial support of the pastor teachers in the church. Perhaps the Judaizers had influenced some of the believers to slack off in their support of the teachers, obviously, for, for many reasons. A special group who were giving their full time to this ministry and who were reimbursed for their labors. This concept of voluntary giving to provide for the Lord's servants was revolutionary since the Jews were taxed for support of their priests and Gentiles paid fees, made vows, and to sustain their religions. The admission is clear that as a teacher got, um, as a teacher shares the good things of the word, a believer is to reciprocate by sharing all good things with this instructor. These verses elaborate on the previous exhortation. First, a solemn warning is sounded that God cannot be mocked. No man can snub God. Um, a man reaps what he sows. Uh, each sower decides what his harvest will be. If a person sows to please his sinful nature, that is, if he spends his money to indulge the flesh, he will reap a harvest that will fade into oblivion. On the other hand, if he uses his funds to support the Lord's work or sows to please the Spirit and promotes his own spiritual growth, he, uh, growth, he will reap a harvest that will last forever. And there's so much in the Bible where uh, generosity the idea of generosity is preached, and God said, hey, this is an area where I want you to test me. If you give to something that I put on your heart, well, for whatever reason, I mean, I've, I've read stories about you know, missionaries walking down the street, and God goes, give them the money in your pocket. And they're like, no. And he's like, give them the money in your pocket. I don't have any money. I just, all, this is all I have. And they give $100 or $20 to some random person that walks by, and then the next thing you know, there's $400 in their account. The bank's like, sorry, we made, we made a mistake. Here's $400. Like, God just pays them back. Um, when I was a kid, my, my best friend's dad was the pastor of our church. And I remember, I don't remember tons of the sermons when I was like seven or eight, but he was, he was almost crying in the sermon. And he said, God told me to put my kids in this Christian school. This is the stop before he came to Chicagoland where I was. And he had no money. And the bill came due. And he didn't want to be indebted to this Christian universe or this Christian school. And he said, God, you told me to do this and there's no money and I don't have the money to do it. And he goes, if you don't, if you don't confirm something, I'm going to rip this page out of the Bible. I was like, whoa, like, oh, it was crazy to hear that at eight years of age. And then he walked in because they had called and said, hey, your balance is up. And he walked in and they said, um, someone just paid all of it. Just walked in and paid the whole thing. So there's something about our our time, our talents, our money, where God's like, hey, test me. Like, like I know you're struggling. This is an area my dad did a really uh, great job. He went, even when he didn't have money, sometimes he would, or he didn't, even when he didn't have enough money for everything, he would give to the church we went to. And I was like, how does that work? And like, is it a credit card? What is it? Um, and he's like, look, God, I don't know how God does it, but God will always do it. And so he's, he's, he's not saying to any specific ministry, but he's saying that, that we, when we do, when we are generous, when we are those types of people, God works in crazy, crazy ways and he does miracles. And he, I mean, me and Shannon have seen it tons in our lives uh, it, where God has, has tested us financially. And it's been like, wow, I can't believe God did that. He came, he came through in so many ways. And he says, and, and verse nine, and let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season, we shall reap. If we do not lose heart, stay in the race, stay in the game. He talked about that a few chapters back, no matter what happens and no matter how few people join you, because in this life, a lot of people will run with you in the quote, proverbial marathon. They'll be with you in mile four, but not with you in mile five. And you're like, where'd they go? Well, everybody's back there, you know, having Gatorade and stuff. They want you to keep going. Well, I'm tired. I'm, I'm sick of being alone. Just keep going. Just keep going. And then all of a sudden you get the second wind at mile six or mile seven, if you will. I don't know how God does it. I don't know why he does it the way he does. Um, his timing is n almost never my timing. I assume it's the same with you, but I don't know how it all works out, but it does. But don't grow weary doing good. It's one of the easiest things to do, or he would have never put this in the letter. 
You don't write letters to people about habits that they already enjoy. You write letters of exhortation because people aren't doing this and people are struggling with this. Let us not grow weary while doing good. It's a very difficult thing, especially when you start to see the culture move away from and people in the evangelical-ish church kind of move with the culture a little bit, kind of move a little left of where we were before and how things have always been. It's easy to look at this physical world, this temporal world, and get very tired and get very exhausted and get very, very weary. That's easy. Paul says, don't give up. You will reap in due season. That, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That is a fact. Verse 10 Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Doing good wherever you go, it's the mark of a Christian. Now, once again, there's discrepancies here, people who say that they're Christians. Um, I will use a sports analogy for you, um, and I realize I'll probably offend a couple of people in here because I know there's at least one Packers fan in here. Aaron Rodgers the Packers quarterback, for many, many years, I pay attention to athletes. I pay attention to things that they say. I pay attention to certain ones, especially ones that beat up the Bears constantly for almost 20 years, and the guy before him, for the 15 before that. Um, so it's easy to pick uh, to pick at them, but there's also Cowboys fans in here too, so we'll, I don't want to get beat up afterwards at potluck. But Aaron Rodgers, for the longest time, said he was a Christian, for the longest time. And he said... Very few things 10, 15 years back that I would have been like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. But some of the stuff coming out of his mouth in the last six months, I'm like, I wonder where he's at. I wonder how close he is to the Lord. And it's, I'm not saying a judgment. I'm just saying when you watch somebody move, it's a little interesting to see, oh, that's not something you would have said. 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And sometimes it's because, well, nowadays Christians just say whatever. Guys, I, there's 50 illustrations like this of celebrities that quote on their Wikipedia page, now so-and-so is a Christian. And then you read some of the stuff they're into and doing right now. You're like, what does that mean then? What does the Christian mean? We're not talking, we're not talking about American celebrity Christian. We're talking about this Christianity, this one right here. Don't give up when you see people doing weird things. Don't give up when you see celebrities sort of going sideways on their faith. Do good. Don't give up in, in doing good. Jesus fed the masses more than once, and he didn't tell the apostles, only give them food if they're with us. You understand? Because <laughs> they wouldn't have fed anybody. How could, how, how could most of them have been with them? They weren't. They, I mean, maybe a few were following from town to town, but not out of 10 plus thousand people. Most of them were there for the free lunch. And because he was going to do magic tricks, in their opinion. Jesus still fed him. He loved him. He felt sorry that they had, some of them have walked so far. He's like, got to feed these people, man. They're, not, they're going to faint on the way home. Little kids. Jesus fed the masses, and he fed them, and he let the rain come down on the just and the unjust. And he still does. In California, lots of rain. Lots of snow. Um, in Tucson, lots of snow, even. Um, so in verse 10, he says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially of those who are of the household of faith. I have seen a lot of Christians really, really hurt each other. And, and it's like, it's like this friendly fire. Like wh why is, why are they nicer to, you know, these people over here than they are to their own, their own brothers and sisters? He goes, it shouldn't be. We need to be good to all people. Do good and don't grow weary in doing good. But also when someone's a Christian and they come onto your doorstep, man, that is your brother. That is your sister. We have to take care. We have to be, the church is said to be a hospital, right? That's what people say. The church is a hospital, but hospitals need resources. They need all sorts of resources. They need people to work them. What if TMC or what if UMC or Banner, what if it was the brand new building, and then they're like, hey, no one's ever going to work there, though. We're never going to walk inside. We have 18 MRI machines. They're worth 8 million bucks each. Great. What is it, what is it profit? That's awesome. It's a great. It's a level one trauma center. Great. No one's working it. All the resources are gone. It, it's worthless. 
So if the church is a hospital, but no one's working it, if the, if, if the fellowship of, of a group of people is this hospital that has the, that has the answer to life, but we just shun everybody else that, that comes around or we don't let anybody in, what good is it? Brand new hospitals are cool, but only if they're actually working hospitals. We need to take care of our, of our brothers and sisters as well. Um, and he starts to uh, close it out in verse 11. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for Christ. This is where he starts to tell the scribe, hey, let me sign off on this letter myself. Let me sign the rest of this. Um, he had done this before. Years ago uh, for the pastor's conference, um, I, I uh, inquired with Chuck Swindoll to try and speak at the conference. This is like 12 years ago. And I called his secretary and I said, hey, we'd love to, you know, for next year. I gave him like a year's notice. And I got an email back from Chuck. Now, do you think it was from Chuck? There was a Chuck signature at the bottom, but it looked computer generated. Yeah. I don't know that it was. I was, I was, it was cool that the letter said, dear Dan, um, thank you so much for the invite. But at this stage of my life and ministry, um, I feel like I am most... Um, like, like the, the best use of my time is to stay preaching in Stonebriar, my church in North Texas. Um, but thank you again. God bless you and all your ministries. Sincerely, uh, Chuck Smidall. I was like, wow, Chuck wrote me a letter. And then I looked at the bottom. I was like, this is a letter that they just changed the name. That's okay. Paul here writes the end of this thing with his own hand. And he says, hey, these people that desire to, to make a good showing in the flesh, to, to look really good on the outside, the reason is they don't, want to be, they don't want to be persecuted like me. Who wants to be the guy who gets persecuted all the time? Let's join with the more vanilla Christianity. That's what so many um, churches have now moved. They've moved into this, quote, progressive Christianity where they're like, hey, we're okay with all of the social things that Christianity is, is definitely not supposed to be about. We're all good. We're all in. We're all, look at how progressive we are. He's like, I'm preaching Christ and him crucified, and I'm persecuted, and these guys aren't perse persecuted because they're compelling you to go back to fleshly deeds. Um, I remember years back, um, the cross is offensive. I mean, it just is, period. I remember I was working at a golf club many, many years back, and um, there was these, I was a caddy, so I was like 14-ish, and there were all these college kids would come back in the summer and work the carts, the golf carts. So the old mobsters would come off the golf course, and they'd clean the clubs, and they'd give them five bucks. I mean, 30 years ago, it was a lot of money for 30 seconds of work. Might still be a lot of money for 30 seconds of work. And I remember this guy, he was like really, really like a coarse, worldly guy. Uh, I think his name was Chad. And he and I got along well. And the next summer, he comes back, and he's wearing a purple Romans 12 hat or something. I was like, what happened to you, bro? And he's like, I got saved, man. At college? He's like, yeah. I'm like, that happens? He's like, yeah. He goes, yeah. And he was like the favorite of all these mobsters. They always, they, because he, he always had a coarse joke. He's good looking, like, like, a, like a football athlete type guy. And they hated him the next summer. And he didn't really say much. They're like, what's up with the cross, man? What are you, religious? And they'd say things like that. He's like, dude, I got saved. Like Jesus, Jesus Christ and him crucified. They're like, we're like loosely Roman Catholic, but that's offensive. Um, so it was just one of those deals where you can be kind of one way with your faith, but if you're out with your faith, it offends. Yeah. Uh, the cross of Christ is, is uh, not for the faint of heart. Uh, verse 13, for not even those who are circumcised, keep the law. Remember that. The people who ever compel you to do, 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 and do, they aren't keeping the law perfectly. They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You gotta give it up. You gotta be in for Christ First and foremost, if bragging about what you did for God was okay, Paul would be the one guy that I would think would be allowed to do it. He's the all-star. However, it's not. 
And he says it, God forbid that I would ever boast in anything that I've ever done except for my weakness. All good things have a proper place and a proper role, but all things bow to Christ. God is the giver of all good things. He's the one that gives you and I gifts. And we enjoy some of those things. And sometimes we get good at some of those things. But we don't then go, well, look at how awesome I am at football. Well, God gave you the athletic build to be an awesome football player. And when an athlete gives the credit to God, it's a beautiful thing. When they become an egomaniac, it's an ugly thing. Boasting in our weakness, Paul said, that's what I can share. That's what, um, he goes, that's, the world is crucified to me, and I am crucified to the world. For, the, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. The only thing circumcision, in theory, Old Testament-wise, meant is that you were uh, in God's household. Like, you did it because God told you to do it. And so you, you obeyed and believed God enough to do this thing. And lastly, 16 through 18, and as many, uh, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Um, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, excuse me, be with your spirit, amen. Um, this is an interesting term, uh, the Israel of God, because Israel means governed by God, so governed by God of God. Israel in the Old Testament was a covenant that God made with Abraham, and he said, you believe me, and I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to create in you a seed, and through that seed is going to come the deliverer. And so this idea of the Israel of God, it's an interesting wordplay. It's the new creation. It's a new citizenship of which God allows those in Christ citizenship. The, the Israel, the, those of God, is this new citizenship, the new Israel that's coming. Um, but grace upon grace is how Paul leaves this, and he often does that. Because I ask nothing more of you. Please understand how much I love you guys, how much I want this church to thrive, how much I want these Judaizers to leave and to reveal and to play their hand out. Please understand how much I love you guys. Don't let them fool you into anything but Christ and him crucified. A couple of thoughts uh, to wrap it up. Obviously, many people have taken advantage of money that comes through a ministry in our culture. You give money to some ministry and you find out some, some ministry guy who's got, you know, three houses, you know, one in Del Mar, one in French Riviera, and he comes to church, he's, you know, wearing Wrangler jeans. We, we just need your money. We need your money. There's a lot of that, okay? You guys know that. It's one of the reasons we don't make a huge thing about money. We don't talk about money hardly ever because we want that to be something that God, that God compels a person, not because Dan's so great at asking or money or building campaigns or whatever. Because I've been through all this. I've, my whole life I've been through, quote, building campaigns and land campaigns and the, the thermometer, how much, is, how much are we down, all that. I've been through all that. Seriously. I was with a, five, a church with five years of buying something, 10 plus acres, five years of buying the land. Every week we saw the thermometer. I'm already hot, you know, just looking at that thermometer. But there's an opposite extreme when, when there's some pastors who can't take their families to dinner. A buddy of mine uh, shared with me years back that there was a board member that wanted him to be poor because he thought that was admirable. He thought it was admirable for him to be dirt poor. And it's like, well, it's admirable for you to have like a normal salary, but like why is it admirable that he has to ask people to take him to lunch? Why is that admirable? And I've seen that in my life in, in several stops. But there needs to be a balance. There needs to be a spirit of generosity among people, but not just financial. That, that people would be like, hey, what do you want, God, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm able to work, I'm able to serve, I'm able to do whatever. Um, I was blown away about, I don't know, three months ago, uh, Jonathan Alameda, who spoke for me not too long ago, whoever, whoever's phone's ringing, you buy, you're buying us coffee. Um, 
That's a Pat Lazovich. Um, this is his pulpit, so it feels very good to say Pat. That's Pat's gig. Um, so um, I don't know, December third or fourth, whatever. Uh, there was twenty something guys here that ripped this carpet up. They just, I mean, like we had more guys than we had work that day, and then the weather was bad, but it was just like the wind in my sail was like, whoa. And lately with the carpet and all of you guys that have done this, like, that's huge. Like, it's like a, a facelift. I mean, we'll get to the rest of it at some point here, but um, it, it's huge to have people come in and just like drive the truck and do that. That's, that's an amazing, amazing thing. And, and you know, it's God when that happens. Um, secondly, it's very easy to get discouraged when we look at the state of the world. When we look at the state, not just of the world and the country, but when we look at the state of like, what's the evangelical movement doing right now? What, what, where is it at? What, what, what are the Southern Baptists doing? What are the wh- whoever's? People who used to be out there preaching just Christ. And now it's not just Christ. It's Christ and something else. Or it's this other thing that they're into. It's very easy to get discouraged. Many people look at the mainstream and they become, they become weary. And they're like, oh, man, they used to be all about the right thing and now they're not. But, but you don't have to be. You can still be your own man or your own woman, your own girl or boy. You follow him. No matter what happens, and you're going to hear well done, no matter how bad it gets here or no matter how good it gets here, you're still going to hear well done because it's a race with you and God. That's it. Satan likes to tell you that it's about everybody else. Start comparing yourself. It's a fun, phenomenal thing. It's a fun thing. No, it's the worst thing to ever do. Why would anything as unique as a human being with DNA that cannot even be counted compare themselves to something that is not the same as them? Because that's what we do. And it's always bad. Comparison trap. There's a reason that word is associated there. Paul says, hang in there. There is a season coming. Stay in the race and you will be you, there will be a season of reaping that comes to you. Thirdly, be gracious to all people. Be loving and gracious to all people. What about people who don't agree with me? Be gracious with them. What about people who make fun of my faith? Be gracious to them. Well, why? Because the only guy you're supposed to listen to did that. <laughs> he modeled it perfectly. You think the Pharisees were like, like easy with Jesus? You think they were like, eh, let's not, let's not rustle them up too much. No, they literally tried to kill him. Like they literally, near the temple, near God's actual house, near God's Shekinah glory, they tried to kill his son. Why? Because he said he came from him. He didn't say, I hate Yahweh. Yahweh's horrible. You guys are idiots. This is the worst religion ever. No, he said, I came from him. All the things I do represent him, his nature, all these things. Let's kill him. They tried almost every time they got around him. They tried to at least shut him up minimally. Jesus was gracious. He, Nicodemus was one of these guys. Nicodemus, he answered Nicodemus's questions. He didn't say, dude, leave those guys and then come talk to me. He didn't say that. He answered his questions. We want to be gracious to all people and we really, really want to. Sometimes it's difficult. I'll close with this story. I was working uh, at, a, at a little Irish, Irish steakhouse type place uh, when I was 19 years old in Bible college. And um, this kid came to me and he said, uh, it, it was, I'm, I, I grew up in a town called Wheaton, which was at the time in the 90s known for having more churches per capita than any place on the earth. And more, what I mean is more Christian churches. That's not the case anymore, but that's how it was. And so most people went to church. When you, when you went to restaurants... At 11.15, they'd be like, oh, the churches must be out. That's what the servers would say at every restaurant you went to. Chili's, the one I worked at, Outback, whatever. They would all be, oh, the churches must be out. So pastor went long today. They got here at 11.30. Like, they don't even go to church, and they knew this. And I said something uh, about somebody that was there, and this guy was really kind of a rotten millionaire guy. And, and he goes, he's pretty bad. He goes, but the Christians are the worst. And I go, what? And he goes, they don't tip at all. I was like, oh, that's not good. Probably shouldn't tell him I'm a Bible college student. No, I did. Um, but he's like, hey, you know, I don't know about you, but like they, they just don't tip much. And they're, they're like, fill my iced tea up. I've been sitting here for 30 seconds. I'm like, wow. 
Not a great reputation, but that's unfortunately not the first time and not the last time I heard that. Be gracious to all people, even when we mess up. Keep, keep running. Like, yeah, you're going to mess up. And maybe you lost your patience with the server or whatever. Okay, next, next time, be gracious, even if they're having a really bad day, even if the service stinks. Be gracious. First world problems, right? Your iced tea's been sitting for five minutes. First world problems. All right, let's pray. Um, Father God, we thank you for uh, this letter that Paul wrote. Uh, God, it is relevant in 2023. It will be relevant next year and the year after, um, as relevant as it was when it was written. We thank you, uh, God, that we can just stand in this in this building and, and worship you and praise you and read your word. We thank you for the time. God, we are blessed to have this meal um, that we have ahead of us, and we thank you. We recognize that you provide, even though we buy it from stores, we, we recognize it's your provision in Jesus' name. Amen.